Okay, we're good. I'm going to say it again for everybody who's watching online. So we have a few people that are watching online, uh, and that's why we have cameras and, and everything set up. <laughs> like you know, look. I, uh, I had some people, when I announced uh, on Facebook page that Don Inman was com coming down and uh, Priscilla was coming up, and they wanted to see it. So I was like, I might be able to, to work this out to where people can see it online. Uh, so you might have some people on Facebook watching this. So those at home, uh, at home watching this at home, welcome. This is the Dental Laboratory Association of Texas. Um, so go ahead and go to the next one. So we're waiting on Michael. He, we had him connected. We had a disconnect, and he's not connecting again, but he may come in later. Uh, okay, go to the next one. The next one. And so Michael Wright, he need, has uh, the Ortho Dent Lab in Williamsville, New York, I think. And that's where he's Skyping in from. He was going to come down, but he has a baby due any minute in the next few weeks. So he, he decided he probably should stay home. Uh, he's, uh, this is going to be, although he probably shouldn't because this is baby number seven. So his wife probably has it down pretty good. He's also the creator of EZRX, the uh, first online ortho uh, website where you can do prescriptions online and your software online and doctors can design their, their so it's all paperless now. Okay, go to the next one. And I'm Kay Tippett. Uh, I have a blog at designerretainer.com. Uh, you can find me. Uh, uh, this is going to be put out on YouTube, so y'all can watch it later. How bad it turns out <laughs> to be. Uh, y'all can watch it later, uh, and I, you can find me also on Facebook. If y'all are, if you're on Facebook, join the group National Association of Orthodontics, Orthodontist National Association of Orthodontic Labs, and uh, there's a great community there that are posting pictures. In fact, somebody asked for a three-way banded appliance and, and within an hour that you got five pictures of what to use. I thought that was amazing. Okay, next one. If y'all want to take a picture of this or write it down, here are the links. Uh, you can find this webcast at Plus Retainer Designer on, if you're on Google Plus. Uh, my YouTube channel is Retainer Designer, uh, YouTube.com Retainer Designer. And uh, these are the links for this site. So you can take a picture. Uh, try to make a bit.ly link so it's shorter, easy to remember, and easy to write down. But that's not any easier. So I'll leave that up a little bit. Uh, so we're, we'll see how this uh, turns out. We'll keep it up for a little bit. Uh, I, I appreciate y'all being here. And, uh, oh, we got some late arrivals, of course. <laughs> Yeah. I got it. Okay, go ahead. And... So the theme of this conference, this whole conference, is merging technology for a new era. Uh, and what I wanted this forum to be about was let's look at the past technologies and how they were in the ortho lab and how they were merged into the current lab. So we'll look at some old technologies and stuff, to, and we'll get a discussion going on that. So look to the past. <laughs> I found these pictures on, on the internet. Uh, and man, dental labs have been around for a long time. And a lot of this equipment, you can't really see it here, but these are full denture setups right here. And this is the Air Force. They got lathes and that we still use today. Go ahead. I found this on the internet. This is a 70-year-old lathe that's still working. Isn't that amazing? I mean, some technologies don't go away. We, we know that. I mean, what would it take for something to replace the lathe? You know, how would you pumice things? You know, I would love to have a pumicing robot because I hate pumicing. You know, make a tumbler or something. I'll, I'll wait an hour for that to pumice so I wouldn't have to do it for five minutes. But then there's my nasty lathe set up. I mean, they're workhorses. They go through everything. And 
and keep on running. Go ahead. Have you all all seen this? The Air Force Manual. They call it the, the Bible of dental technology. Uh, when I went to lab school, this is what we went out of. It's about that thick. And the ortho section is about four or five pages. <laughs> and so, but I, I bruised through it during this, and some things don't change, wire bending. Some things do. Who fits custom bands? Who makes custom bands now? Anybody? You do. Yeah, you do too. Yeah, see, I use preform. Go next one. I think it's on the next one. So I use preform and just. But. Yeah. Do y'all? Do y'all? Do you fit bands? Once in a while, we have to. Make a band. Yeah, but we just take a a, a, um, a prefab band and we just trim it. And That's use what I the do. same band. We don't we don't keep blank band material anymore. Can we even find blank band material? Yes, JBT has it. Ah, there you go, <laughs> plug. <laughs> and then I've seen this rolling around in my orthodontist office, uh, arch forming thing. Has anybody ever used that? They're called turrets. Turrets. Do y'all still use them? Oh yeah. Oh, let's see, some things don't go away. Well, the and dinosaurs it, still have them, but you can't buy them anymore. I think oh. Great Lakes has one, but. Not a, a, it's too large, but like that one, I think a lot of us had them from 30 or 40 years ago, and we still have them. Oh, wow. See, I, I saw them rolling around in the drawers in the orthodontic office. Go ahead. Of what blue? The turret? The turret? So you made your own because you needed one. Oh, so you can get different sizes. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that, uh, um, I guess the orthodontist came out with preformed arch wires and that kind of went to the side. And, uh, I've never used, I've got a, 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 a rack of this many pre-formed large wires. I've got to be hundreds of them at least. Um, I never use them. People, I, I always look at them and go, do people actually use those? See, I have a rack of wraparound wires that are all different sizes. The loops yeah. are already in there, and I I never use them. Yeah. And Well, it, they're actually flat labial bow, but I've never been asked for that. So, And then... I think Ernie, who couldn't be here today, Ernie uh, Cardenas from Retainer Factory in San Antonio, he still has one of these doll well. You got one? They don't go. They don't die, do they? They still work. I uh, yeah. yeah, they're the best. They're the best welder you can get. Uh, I was at a pedo class uh, in New Orleans. I was talking to the Rocky Mountain people because I, I grew up on the Mountains with the Bernard and I got back to the laboratory. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> they still work. Oh, it, yeah. It's perfect, yeah. The old saying, they don't make them like they used to work. I bought one online one time from India. It came in a, uh, what's the sack? It came in a sack and it was all smashed and broken. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I think I paid like $200 for it. I, I didn't fully try and recover it. <laughs> wow, it came in a sack. Said, one of my doctors had one. I went over to his office. I, I bought one from a doctor's office, a newer model, and I paid for it with retainers. I'm like, I'll give you so many free retainers, and, and it's because they're like, we don't ever use this anymore. It's what? In a burlap bag. In a burlap bag, are you serious? No padding or anything. Like, here you go. Yeah. Oh, nice. Wow. That's excellent. Let's see, is that Michael right? Oh, he show up? <coughs> okay. Uh, let's go to the next one. 
Okay, so I'm going to define some terms. Again, this is my presentation. Uh, these may not be the official definitions, but they're mine. So we're going to use them for the rest of this class. Merging and replacement. So merging technologies together, replacing technologies. What's the difference? Merging, bringing alongside, using existing technology. Replacement replaces an existing technology. Uh, although it may start alongside merging, and you know, I use both, and then <coughs> one goes away. Go ahead. So an example, this might be a bad example, might be a good example. Some still use that. I don't even know where mine's at. This is what I use, I, the hydroflux welder. And then the next step up. So y'all's input. Is this merging or replacement or a little bit of both? Merging. Merging? You I, I got the hydroplane and I also got the base. And you, do y'all still hydroplane? Yeah, we do. We, we still like to solder uh, wire to band connections, but all wire to wire connections are laser welded uh, and, and only laser welded. Uh, oh. but so wire to wire, but band to wire. Yeah, band to wire, it's, it's very easy to blow through the bands when you're trying to weld a wire to a band. It takes a, a little higher skill set. And we found, too, that, that because the doctors are so used to the way that that solder joint looks on fixed appliances like quads or any expand, expansion appliance, that the they fear that that wire <coughs> laser welded to the band is weak. And it, it's not, but that's the perception. So we still solder to bands, but all wire to wire is, is just strictly laser welded. So go up, go up here. We're, see, y'all are seeing how the sausage is made. <laughs> so y'all can do it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, we were having some problem after laser, yeah. laser, laser, laser to a band. And then go back to can tours. So we have to click that button every time. In the, the very, where was it breaking? If you look at it under a microscope, you'll see that when you laser weld, you you do damage the wire. You know, you you take a little chunk out of the wire. So what we do is we try to we try to start our weld further back. You know, and when we do that same same thing with our wire to wire on an atoms clasp, we don't start the weld at the most anterior portion of the atoms clasp. We we started in maybe about a, a third of the, third of the way distal. And we found that eliminated any of those issues. Yeah. Yeah, the doctors are still used to seeing solder. And if it's done right, it looks great right out of the package because it's nice and shiny and 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 but you know as soon as that appliance comes back then it's it's you know the solder now is dark. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of breakage on on um, soldered labial bows to atoms clasps. Within a couple of years, those those appliances always came back. You'd see the solder; it was it was you could take a bird yeah, and you could just take a bird beak and just kind of crunch it off. And uh, we we feel that that was due partly to how that appliance was clean, and partly due to that uh, person patient's pH. And, but we do know that solder breaks down over time in the mouth. So the laser weld is, is you know, and let's just look at laser welding from a standpoint of uh, manufacturing. If I'm going to solder a labial bow to an atoms clasp, I have to make sure that that area is clean. Then I have to prepare it with heat shield. Then I have to prepare it with flux. Then I have to solder it and you know, hopefully not anneal anything, then I have to undo all that. I have to, you know, with the steam cleaner, get rid of that flux and heat shield, maybe hit it with a heatless stone, rubber wheel it, and high shine. That's a lot of steps. If I bring it into the laser welder, it's in the laser welder, and it's done. So there's, there's a tremendous advantage to uh, laser welding. Um, in our, in our laboratory, we just found it was such a hard decision for us to make because I think our first laser welder was $16,000. And 
it was a huge decision to make. And when we made it two days later, we, we started looking for a backup laser welder because we never wanted to be without a laser welder. You know, that's the thing. We have, we have this small one that we started with, the $16,000 one, and we bought a much bigger unit once we, nicer unit once we realized how much we liked laser welding because we, we wanted to have, the, the bigger laser welder we bought has a better ergonomics so it's more comfortable for the technicians. The little bench top ones are, are not quite as comfortable. They do as good a job because in orthodontics, you don't need a whole lot of power. You're not laser welding palladium or anything. Um, our laser welder has never gone down to answer your question. So, so we found them to be very reliable. How about your, yours? Well, I had to have them. They destroyed them when I got married. They, they just had them. Oh, okay. You have to maintain them. So I had the guy come in with $1,000 or so. Do you, 90% uh, of the stuff in there, do Yeah, I've never done that. I know what you're talking about. I've never done that. Yeah, because it's real hard to repair a, an old solder joint. The, the, nothing wants to flow there. You know, you can try cleaning it up as much as possible, but it just Man, doesn't it work. it smells terrible. Oh, it does. Man, when you get a punch back out of the mouth, solder <coughs> it is nasty. In regards to the solder, I will interject what a lot of times technicians don't know and even lab owners don't know, that based on the amount of heat, that is in that solder joint for any given time, you harden that solder, you temper it. So you take it from that very soft malleable state, and if when the silver solder that we use in wire, it flows at a little over 1100 degrees. Stainless steel wire starts breaking down at 1200 degrees. If a technician's not experienced and they're there for the longest time, they're heating that silver solder, from its flow point of a little, a little over 1100 Fahrenheit, and the hotter it gets and the longer it is, it becomes hard and brittle. So if you've ever had to redo a solder joint and you feel like that solder is just so hard, well, you've hardened it. And in the mouth and in the field, it becomes brittle, and that's where you can just chip it away at times. So the technique can compromise a solder joint, and no one really knows about it because we've never been taught as a technician and I and I would almost get yes most of you guys have never been really functionally shown how to silver solder with either the hydroplane or propane and acetylene and oxygen. Oh let that out. Propane and acetylene now. Forget about that. That's what we use in lab school. Um, Go ahead. I heard um, that after the sergeant water Quenching it, kind of rich. <laughs> Is that what y'all do for certain metals? Sure. Okay. But no, you're not supposed to. You you let it come back to room temperature right. yeah, and not, not squelch it. What if you steam it? Put the steamer right up. Because that's a hot I, steamer. That's hot, but I, I don't know. That's your noble metals. You well. Yeah. <laughs> that's speaking about technology going out. Go ahead and go to the. Next one. <coughs> How do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> Go up here. So who is thinking about maybe upgrading that part? Again, this is just one example. If anybody has any other examples, uh, you already went. Is there anything past laser welding? 
I mean, that's... No, but the, the good news with laser welding is that they're using it in jewelry a lot as well. So there's, there's used units available now. Oh, they're see. easier to source. So that's what, what when we bought our second laser welder, that's what we did. We bought it from a jewelry maker. And uh, I didn't even think about that. Because you know. I, I have a jewelry catalog, Casker, which is where we bought our Hydroflux, which was a little cheaper than through a dental catalog. And they have lots of stuff that I'm like, that's <laughs> dental, that's dental, that's dental. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a little cheaper, that's a little cheaper. That's amazing. It's funny, even in the 3D technologies, the uh, the two are very similar, where um, you can print wax for Crown and Bridge, you can print wax for jewelry. So. That's right. Um, I have a question for you. On the laser welders, or maybe um, Mr. Anderson, do you ever have to have them calibrated onto how hot they project their laser? Go ahead and go with this. Well, you can, real, you can adjust that. Um, it's I think that... The, the term is joules, right? The and in 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 uh, silver so or silver, uh, I'm sorry, stainless steel. I think you want something about five or six joules, but they're they're highly adjustable. Okay, so you can. Oh yeah, you can adjust, and and I don't use it ever anymore. So I'm I'm I, I apologize if I misstate anything, but you can uh, adjust the intensity. You can adjust the duration of the hit. You can adjust the shape of the hit. So, for example, um, the, the smaller diameter the hit, the deeper it can penetrate for the same amount of, of power. So they're, they're very highly adjustable. So when he was saying that he was experiencing breakage just outside of the laser valve, could that have anything to do with overheating the stainless steel wire? I don't think I, I don't think it would be overheating. I think it would be it's it's more of where that first hit happens. I don't think it's a heat issue. Because I've helped um, another lab who was calling me with many different questions about my laser welder. Actually, he had a phaser welder. Okay. That he had just sent it back for. Pre-calibration and it was just blowing holes through his wire and his bands and he was sending me pictures and you could see where the, the splash of the molten stainless was just, you know, it was like water dropping in a, in a bucket of water. And um, I said, you know, that doesn't look right. Send it back and tell me recalibrate it. And three days later, he said, yeah, they sent it to me without calibrating the new frame that they had put into it. So it was just ramped up so high that whatever it was doing um, was just destroying all their work. Those are those phasers. Anybody here ever worked with one of those? Phaser? The phasers. They market them to be as good as a laser, um, but they're they're a little different. They have an electrode in it, and you as you you push on to the uh, area that you want to weld. Uh, there's a little pin that engages, and then the energy is released. Uh, I, I know that um, a friend of mine, uh, New England Ortho Lab, he had one, and he had very good luck with it. I tried one at a dental show like this one time, and it, and it scared the hell out of me because you, you, you're pushing on it, and then it, you get a, a spark. Did you sell them? No. Okay. No. I don't like them. <laughs> it's all of this new technology is outside my lab ownership. So I'm here like everyone else learning and, and, well, and then to answer questions. I was thinking it was going to be replacement, but it looks like you got to use a little mixture of both, to, of, of both of those. So well, moving on to, well, Biostar, that's what I think of when I think of technology coming in that can shake up the ortho lab industry. And when I started my lab 2004, it was already kind of the scary part was over and it kind of had settled down to some offices were using it, some were. Uh, some offices started using it, and their assistants were terrible at it, so then they sent it to the lab to, to make. Um, and I wouldn't say this is really merging, because both of these are still being used. But I know Priscilla has a lot of experience with Biostar, and she has a really great... You had how many at one time? When I shut down my lab, 
in 98, I had three functioning biostars that we, we worked simultaneously. And you're making retainers. And we were doing cold cure as well. Um, I received, I bought my first biostar in 71. And it was hard to get doctors interested in the Biostar because it was new technology, and they all swore that it was an inferior product. And at that time, Great Lakes only had it in blue, that icy blue plastic, and they said they could never have any other color, there would never be any pink. And the doctors that I was doing work for felt, yeah, okay, if it's a better retainer, but we don't like the pink. So we were doing about 50 retainers a day on the Biostar. Now, I, that was a lot. It, it was a great concept. And um, within about four years, I went out and I developed pink before Great Lakes ever did because I had such need. And it got to the point where doctors were then going out and buying their own Biostar, bringing it into their offices not sending lab work to me, but the girls couldn't figure out how the Biostars worked. They just didn't have the mentality to stand there and fig figure out the physics of sucking down something on a model. So hence why I went from one to two to three Biostars, because I wound up getting leftover Biostars that doctors didn't want. And then at the time, all offices only had engine arms for doing retainer work. And the Biostar material required high speed, either an air turbine or the upcoming hand piece of set. The electric. The electric one. So that was another thing doctors didn't um, realize when they bought a Biostar that they'd have to also get a more expensive, different type of hand piece. And that's a good point with all new technology. Yeah. There's always extras that come with it that's usually not included. And the, thing. the Biostars are pressure forming, whereas the, the other ones are vacuum for that. So the Biostar pushes the plastic down, the other ones suck it down. And did, sorry, did you get into, you actually created the pink foil. I created the pink. You went out and found the plastic and, and create your own and color, it, pink yes, color. That is correct. A food grade plastic long before Great Lakes did. That's, and and then, then eventually, they just took the, the sheet material into a different direction, and I was busy making retainers and having babies. <laughs> well, I remember you, the setup you had. You had a round table, and you would set one and heat the material and then start setting the other right. round. And heat that that was and our process. Go back and then suck down, suck down, suck yeah. down. Yeah. That, that's, and you, uh, if I remember right, you were doing lowers, and at that time Great Lakes was saying, no, no do lowers. I had developed a means of doing lower retainers. I was able to incorporate expansion screws into maxillary pallets, um, did splints. Yeah, I mean, if there's a will, there's a way. And you just have to understand the concept. The physics behind sucking something down into a bowl-shaped environment, you have problems, but you work around the problems. Um, and blowouts. I mean, Times do you have the plastic where it's thinned itself too much, you have a hole in it, now you have to start over. You just learn not to have remakes. And, you know, they've upgraded. I mean, what does it say? I can't read it. Oh, it's the year. 67? Wow. I'm sorry, 76. Okay. 67276. Okay. So that was the first. And, of course, they've upgraded them, and now it's just. Mine, you put in a code, and you don't have to worry about watching it in the slump and, and all that stuff. And yeah, but now they break. <laughs> they used yes. to never break. Yeah, and I had to send mine back twice because uh, yep. they kept blowing the fuses. Who, who here has a bioform or bioform-like device? And so a few of y'all do. Do y'all make retainers, or is it just – y'all can talk. What do you all think is better, the vacuum uh, machine or the one with pressure direction? The pressure is a much better fitting setup. Yeah, what worries me about these is they have like barcode readers and stuff now in them. And I'm thinking um, it says just set it and forget it, or you just put it on there. But if there was an issue with the, the 
the brain of the of the computer in it or the barcode reader, I wouldn't know necessarily that it was getting really to the wrong temperature or anything like that. It takes the thought process away the thought process away from you to get to where if you have a problem how do you troubleshoot it because you right. don't know. Well I've got a real one. I got the first one. Never had it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, never had yeah. Let's see they what's the year on this one that they put the computers in there? Uh, 88 to 99. 88 to 99. That's right. Yeah. And it's just a timer on there. So that the best of both worlds. Now to talk about merging them in. Was, was it a problem when you first got yours? To I mean, how long did it take for you to for a bulk of your business to be put on the Biostar? When I had the Biostar and I wanted to go out and solicit to the doctors, I made myself a handful of retainers and my marketing element was I'd stand on it in their office. And when it didn't break, they, they were sold on the material. Because the material is a polyvinyl chloride plastic, and it's very tough. And so with that being said, um, the doctors accepted my lab as, as their go-to. And then I in Southern California, at that time, I became the mm -hmm. Biostar mm -hmm. guru. I mean, any doctor that was doing large volume of retainers was having my lab do it and we were doing it with the five stars. And then of course all the colors and the patterns came out and then we had to change. We all had to change to colors. And then the patterns, you couldn't do the patterns on the five star until they came out with all their different patterns. And by then it was the nineties and we went from doing most of our Retainer work on the Biostar and do a, doing a combination of the cold here. And then the, the designs, and so we went from 100% Biostar to 50 50 Biostar cold here, and then 25%, 75% custom retainers, and eventually I just phased out the Biostar. Yeah, we offered uh, the Biostar retainers and marketed them as unbreakable, and uh, we, we, uh, increase the price for the unbreakable and we I forget what the guarantee we put on them I think it was a uh, lifetime but we didn't take into consideration the wires <laughs> so we were selling an unbreakable retainer and the wires were breaking so <laughs> um, we uh, we never got it going like Priscilla did it, it we just didn't just didn't take off and and that's not uncommon for something to do well in one area of the country and not do well in another area of the country. Um, and so, we, but we have two bio stars and when one of them goes down, uh, the staff is going nuts. You know, they, they want that loaner bio star because they, they can't, and we do so much with the bio stars, everything from duplicating models to, um, you know, invisible retainers to, uh, soft mouth guards. Uh, we, we, we use the Biostar a lot. We also are, um, we produce a product called Perio Protect. Uh, we're one of four labs in the country that uh, were licensed by Perio Protect. And it's, it's pressing a soft material uh, onto a, um, we, we, we modify the model and we press this, basically it looks like a mouth guard and they use it to deliver medication for uh, Perio uh, issues and uh, so we use it for that a lot too so but I'll tell you the funny thing is you know talking about the old versus the new when we have to make a, a mouth guard with with those lo the logo in it what's the company that sells this? Proform. Proform you know and you know you want to have that logo in a specific area we I can't do it on the bios or none of us can so we we go back to the vacuum form <coughs> and line it up and and Yes, they do. Yeah, we'll we'll cut it too, some if we have to, but but uh, um, we we never got good at doing the. No. Um, so we just we we do the press. It's funny because with the Perio Protect, there's logos all over that material, and they were talking about changing the material where there was just one logo and where they wanted that logo to be, and. Um, 
Great Lakes is one of the other laboratories that makes Perioprotect, and we were in the same meeting, and, and we just we argued very strongly not to do that because right now we can't miss because the logos are all over the place. You know, we just press it. And we don't have to worry about it. We're, Michael Wright's trying to log on right now. So. Well, and so it looks like this is merging. I mean, y'all were able to blend it into, or did it didn't really replace the old school? Well, the BioStar gave us the capability of doing soft mouth bars that were not available except through the positioner type process, correct? Is that stuff didn't exist <coughs> in the 70s. Silicone, 80s. pouring up the silicone, that kind of thing? I don't I don't think mouth soft mouth guards unless it's the fabricated the same way positioners were done were offered. So the Biostar allowed every lab that I had Biostar start doing mouth mouth guards, sports guards. Um, Correct, soft correct scissors sucks. You can do all those with the vacuum, with the old vacuum. Which came first? Yeah, which did? I, I, don't I know. thought the Biostar was the first. Oh, it might be. It was. Biostar was first, and, and then, then they came out with Buffalo the. Buffalo Devil came out with the, their the, vacuum I, thing. Because how old that thing looks. It <laughs> looks I, super I, old. I, I bought a new one last year. I did that because the old one that had to make in the 70s was, uh, you know, lasted 30 years, or almost 40 years. So almost as old as that lathe <laughs> before. Yeah, I've got a 40 year old. <laughs> so technology, I think, brings accessibility to a lot that ordinarily wouldn't have had that capability. Excellent. So is that merging or? Establishing a new process and a new, new technology. It's a whole That's new old. category I didn't even think about. It's extra, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Extra technology. Expanded, expanded technology, expanded products. Go ahead and go to the next <clears> slide. <throat> now, I sent out a, uh, a survey. We'll get to those in a little bit, a little online survey to get some ideas from around the country and the world. Um, and one of the one of the topics I wanted to cover was just tools and materials. Uh, has anybody found something new, like as a burr, pliers, bristle brushes that changed the way you did things in the lab? Yes? Well, as far as trimming the invisible materials, I went to Harbor Freight and found drum sanders. You, drum sanders at Harbor Freight? Oh, the belt thing? No? No, no it's a, like a really large rubber band. Oh. Uh, that little round one, it's, it's got a quarter inch chain that goes in the middle of it. Trim all the quarters with that. It takes seconds. Oh, wow. Instead of trying to contour with a hand piece and. Yeah, it's a good, cost about $9. It comes with a few different uh, sizes. There's a. Oh wow! And, yeah, I didn't. Metal prices would be probably the <laughs> right. Nine, Nine bucks. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, pliers. I mean, I know we have our pliers, and they're like extensions of our hands. And my favorite one broke last week, and I, I'm lost a little bit until I get a new one. Uh, has anybody ever ventured out? And got a new plier, and it helped y'all. I have my trusty three, basically. My bird beats, the three prongs, and uh, one or two others. But uh, I, I have over 100. My, my grandparents started this lab in the 70s, and just I acquired so many of them over time. I look at them, and it's fun to go through them and see what they do. <clears> so I'm like, oh, the next time I need to make the fatty, I have a bend, but then I never just about everything, everything by hand. But I did recently find a set of pliers that are for um, the vacuum form materials for the containers and to make, um, to put different dimples. Starts with H. Hilgers? No. 
he'll, but you make bubbles in it. And, yeah, bubbles. Yeah, I've seen those. Things to put uh, pressure on to create or to make one side of the tube space bigger. So I can go into to that area. Were you able to market that? Or no, no, I've got a different way of doing it if I wanted to. I, I'm just a little hesitant. I'm sure these tools have to be heated. Oh yeah. And I worry I would just mess it up. Blow through it. <laughs> yeah. So I usually try to adapt the model before going. Oh yeah, reset a tooth before. Uh, go to the next one, if, unless anybody has. But I, I, I've seen that the, there's a ceramic burr out. Has anybody tried this ceramic burrs? I've seen uh, something. How are they? They looked interesting. They don't cut wire, it right? Was real sharp. What was real sharp? The, it's a ceramic burr. Oh, and it was just real sharp? Mm -hmm. and, and it did look smooth. Well, I saw one in a magazine. It looked like a, a pencil, rubber, but maybe that was it. The, the, the idea is, I think, is the ceramic burr will cut acrylic but not wire. Right. You can't. This uh, wire will ruin it. It won't take. You don't want to use your metal or anything. Oh. But he, he has some of it. They come up with some available parts for it. Oh, auto okay. So they yeah. can adjust a retainer and put it back in the mouth and don't have to worry about it. Oh. Uh, what about stainless steel bristle brushes? I use those on every retainer. I've always used them, and I think I was the first one to bring them into the industry. I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I, got my... I, I was using horsehair, whatever they use, and I use stainless steel bristle brushes to remove the acrylic. From the wire, so I don't nick the wire, and so that's I'll run it around there real quick. Um, so I also use these. Hey, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I also use these. Have you all seen those patho bristle brushes? I use those to polish my metals, and they're expensive. And my acrylic guy who does our metal also loves those things. And when he runs out, he gets mad at me. But it it, it comes like the yellow is is pumice gray. It'll it'll put pumice shine on there. And then if they get lighter and lighter, and so you can just get a few birds and just line them up and just run them through there. But that was one of a technology I like to try. I want to look into that uh, porcelain, porcelain ceramic one. Go ahead. Uh, some more things. Uh, I stole some pictures off websites, as, as you know. Uh, there's Veriflex. Here's Magicreel. Anybody have any experience with Magicreel? I did it once when it was in the monitor. Form, but I didn't. I know they changed it to powder, but I haven't tried it since then. Okay, yeah, I, I know what it first. Came I worked out. on back engineering it. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but when I found the, the they call it uh, chromothermic changing pigments for like nine hundred dollars a pound. I thought mm, I can't compete with right. How much do they charge for? Yeah, a little starter kit. It, that, that's one of the technologies that I've tried, and it's sitting in a shelf now. I occasionally have an article that they didn't last, and it still works. Oh, because I think mine might have went bad, because the pigment was in the monomer at that time. Right. And so the monomer yeah. would go bad. This was the powder. I think, yeah, they, they changed it. They initially had the pigment in, in, the, in the monomer, and... Some of my labs started fielding me on it. Are you ever going to make it? And I go, well, I don't know. So I brought in one of the kits and I back engineered it. And then the complaints were, well, I'm paying forty dollars for two ounces of monomer, and I just tipped it over. Oh. And so I thought, well, yeah. And I would always want to have to do this and, and right. do the eyedropper. So I started incorporating the pigment into the powder. And I got my product that I was happy with, but then when I went out to buy the pigment, I, I, I couldn't justify one pound a week or a month that would last laboratories 100 years. So I just didn't do anything with it. But um, 
have it being in the liquid, I can see different problems with dumping it over or, as you say, it dries up because monomer's not stable <laughs> it's, for the most part. I thought I ruined it the first time because I pulled it out of the pressure pot and it was white. Uh -huh. Like, that was black when I put it in there. And I was like, oh, yeah, it changes colors. <laughs> Uh, and this is Bearflex. Anybody use Bearflex? How do y'all like it? It, uh, it, it seems to be a good alternative for some doctors. It's what? Yeah, we still pre-mix and put it on there, and we do it like our regular splint. But it's heat softening acrylic. Don, do you? We use it for dual, uh, like dual laminate. Uh, I guess you wouldn't call it dual laminate. Hard soft splints. Yes, that's what we. So we, you know, we we use it for the, it, you know, where it contacts the teeth, and then we use hard acrylic over top of that. Oh, okay. So, uh, what dual laminates do you use? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know for the. You mean the pressure form? The, the pressure, pressure form, form ones? Yeah. Um, I want to guess Rain Tree because we we order a lot of stuff through Rain Tree, another company owned by Den Supply. Raintree, I believe, is the only ones that do the dual laminate. And in 79, I initially researched and developed that. But at the time, I couldn't get the soft material not to delaminate mm -hmm. um, because of the process and the type of material. And so that kind of got parked. And then, you know, baby number three came along and it kind of <laughs> never got back to it. Then, um, Someone out there, I think it was either um, Raintree or, or Proform company came out with them. But there's just one company now, and it's, it comes out of Raintree, and they have three thicknesses of the. Now you talk about it, like Uh huh. Right, like them. Yeah, it's in, yeah, they, 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 they do. They do, but the, yeah. the question was Great Lake sells Raintree's product. Okay. So yeah, the shoe dual, of us. dual laminate material. Uh, it's, it's clear when it's vacuum form, but once you put hard acrylic over it, it turns opaque. Yeah, cloudy. So, yeah, so it doesn't look really good, but it's a really good durable material. It's probably the most durable dual laminate stuff there is. But um, Fresident has a dual laminate track B. Uh, yeah, Fresident, we use Which yeah. is really clear and it's really rigid, but it, uh, I've had issues with it bubbles, getting bubbles in it or gets moisture in the product. Mm. Pro, uh, that was True Tain has a dual laminate, but it's so flimsy that if you put hard acrylic on it, they'll end up cracking the acrylic. It's so flimsy. And um, Proform has some, but it's so thick. I think, um, actually, I have, my problem is I have a number of problems with, with the product. And I know um, Glidewell makes the dual laminate with the hard acrylic uh, night guards. And every time I, I go to these dentist offices, they're like, oh, we get ours from, from Glidewell, and this is how it looks. Can you make this? <laughs> and so far, I haven't been able to do it. It's really frustrating. Actually, Glidewell is using the Fresnet product. It's from really? It's not really name different. It's not. Oh, wow. And the Fresnet product is really good. We made a little container. Right? Yeah. You know the little dry packets? We take it out of the box and put it in our little what we oh. unseal the package. We put in that little container with all that little dry packets. <laughs> Do not eat. I've only had one person like send me samples of it, and that's where I had troubles with all the bubbles. Troubles with all the How long ago was that supposed to be? Uh, a couple of years. So they seal like only 10 in a packet now. They keep them separately sealed so you can uh, avoid that problem. And as soon as I open that packet, I put it into my own dry container. Great Lakes has a part of it. It, they're individually, that's the ones I buy from Shoe. Yeah. And I have a lot of success with it. I like a dark line. It doesn't clear. That's not clear. And I'm also using it for smart roots. And a lot of the doctors, and one of the best one of my doctors, the best one I kept that since was called Lily. They like that material just because it's more comfortable and it holds the heat and it doesn't wear out like that. The cloudy? It's so durable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cloudy, I got around that by not touching the monomer to the soft side. The, the new acrylic can't touch the. Right. Yeah. No. I. So if I if it touches, I notice it gets cloudy. But if I keep it separate. Well, I take rope wax and 
Yes. That's what we do. The suck down and leave it kind of big. No. Wouldn't the heat softening acrylic on a dual laminate material like that tend to want to be laminated? I don't. I use hard acrylic. I don't use the Fairflex on that. Uh, Don, you offer a product, smart like a you said smart move. Do you use? We use um. We use a different material now. Um, for our any anything to move teeth, I cannot think of the name of it. It's very expensive. They supposedly it was the original Invisalign material. It, <coughs> it, anybody? It's. I've tried it. it. What's the name of it? Dura something or Dura. I can't remember what it's called. I'll. I'll, I'll it sitting right where all my stuff is. I look at it every day. And I still can't remember what it's called. I'll, I had somebody bring me some. So he was doing a lot of. Well, what's interesting is it's a it's an it's an O3O material, but it's much more durable than the O4O material from anybody else. Right, you can tell by just handling it. And it's very expensive. The heat's kind of strange. It kind of heats unlevel. It's like I'll I'll get the name uh, if we take a break or whatever. I'll call the office. Okay. We'll take a break in about thirty minutes. One last question about the Veriflex. Is there a, a, a liquid polishing compound that we can, that um, right now I use a fine pumice and then a dry, dry my wheel, you know, to get it shiny, but the friction just, you know, tends to, it doesn't want to shine up like hard acrylic would do this. As you're polishing it, the heat, the heat softens will. it down. Yeah, yeah I just. Try, try putting a few droplets of water on your rag wheel. Yeah, she sells a high shine that I use for those, and they, I use them for everything. So it, it, uh, but you have to put, like, usually my hands are already wet from rinsing off the pumice, so I'll just touch my hand to the wheel to kind of cool it off, and then I'll high shine it. Yeah, incorporate a little moisture on your rag wheel to see if that cuts that hot friction from the fat, the fibers. Here's something I've run into. Too. I used to love the lead center wheels. They had a super soft yeah. panel. Um, now you can't find those. It's all the regular little blue wheels. And I have to turn that on low so I don't burn my drill. Where I used to use that lead center on the iron, it was just so soft it never burned it. But I can't, those wheels have been discontinued. Are they a flannel wheel? I'm not sure if it was flannel, but it was super soft. And the blue plastic centered buffs, you don't like that fabric? No. No. The problem started happening too in the last batch of those lead center wheels. You polish your first one, a string started flying everywhere. <laughs> it was so soft, it wouldn't even hold its on threading together. So I stopped getting them. That, I'll, you can always tell when my guy uses a new wheel. Or, when I go to quality control, there's little strings wrapped around the, right. the clasp and, <laughs> and things. I gotta cut them off. Let's see what's next. So that's definitely merging and bringing it in, offering new products. Uh, these are some of the questions I asked uh, on online. You know, what's one big technolo technological advancement in your lab from startup until now? And uh, we purchased a laser builder. That was in Tanner Shop in New Jersey, and then the help of Web Info. Which we'll get into that in a little bit, you know, searching for appliances. At, um, posting something on Facebook, and I think somebody wanted a, a tooth distalizer or something like that, and and I had mentioned the Inman power component, and she said she wanted to use that, but she couldn't use it, and then you ended up posting another picture of a whole different appliance. On the, it, it was great, so the, the web info is great. Go ahead. Uh, Safer personal environmental health issues for the technician, particularly while using monomer. Uh, I kind of wonder what it was like. I don't know. In the 70s, was there carbon filters and things for the monomer, or, or we we had exhaust. We used an exhaust fan. Uh, I don't know when Great Lakes came out with that box, but um, about 85, 88. Does anybody use that box? Yeah. I do. 
we couldn't, our technicians just couldn't get the hang of it. I had to take the glass out. Okay. So I had more space. But I felt that it sucked in and just put it back out into the room. So mm -hmm. it was taking it away from me. And we all know that we can't smell it anymore. Right. But when people <laughs> would come in the lab, you know, it hits them like an invisible wall. So it was like, okay, is the charcoal not good enough for the, the monitor? But uh, at least I wasn't breathing. <laughs> it was pulling it away from me. Yeah. When I was in the <clears throat> Air Force, I worked in a small room with bad ventilation. It made me wear some sort of monitor around with me. And it just smelled super strong in there. But still, after all that, I had to wear it for two weeks. It said still what I've been breathing in wasn't enough to cause any kind of harm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a pretty interesting test. To do. So. I just heard it was bad for pregnant women. Of course, I've seen that people have reaction to touching it. Yeah. Right. Else. yeah. This, this lady, I'll mention her a little later, she actually had a really bad reaction, and it took them a long time. Uh, she's 55. I'll, I'm going to try to bring her here next year to talk to us about safety in the ortho lab and dust and all that. And she had, She's 55. She actually had to retire. She goes, I, I love the work, and I wish I would have taken better precautions. And she would have multiple strokes in one day. Wow. And they couldn't figure it out, and then it finally came to the chemicals she was interacting with. So, you know, I, I believe the safety is getting better, and uh, the more regulations makes businesses harder, but uh, we'll get to that uh, a little later. Um, <coughs> take advancement from my lab was switching to billing on a computer from a typewriter. Yes, that long ago. Did anybody ever use typewriters for billing? You did? Until, yeah, about five years ago. I uh, upgraded to QuickBooks. Wow! <laughs> my grandmother had always done, that's what I took over. My grandmother always insisted on doing the same since she, that she had done for 30 years. You're, that's my mom, hot rod, or doing it that way. It took me forever to do it. But we, now that she's dealing with QuickBooks, she's sold on it. But it took a long time to get the technology to the head. Yes. yes. What did y'all start out with? Handwriting? Yep, yep. Handwriting. Yeah, Play tablets? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dual copy. Dual copy. NCR. And everything came in and got written down. And then at the end of the month, you just tallied it up. And one copy got kept in the lab, and the other copy was the doctor's statement. And then... I think in about 89, I went to a um, software writer and tried to work with them for about six months doing an orthodontic lab program for Macintosh. And that's when Macs were this big. <laughs> Wildstar were arcade. Um, and that didn't plan out. So I just, for, for the lab, I just did my own spreadsheet and mm -hmm. did templates and then made a template for each doctor, and then every day I would just type in on a spreadsheet up there. Oh, that's what y'all do, right? You, you're a, you're a Excel whiz right. with yours. And so we're trying to convert to access. It's just, it's a little harder for me to go to run access as Excel, so, but we're kind of converting. Well, my first couple of years, I had trouble with this, I still work with it. Last one, I might just put the price of the client down at the bottom corner. Mm -hmm. End of the month, I just start to get a little receipt stapled to that. That's what, I, that's what it was. I, I handed it. I did that for a couple of years. It's not very hard. You just, I don't know about most of you, but I was self taught. Everything I learned in business, I learned just by failing or doing the bad job previous to would have to think outside the box. box. I had no experience. I had lots of family members that were not savvy to business, accounting, and everything I've done, it's just, well, if there's going to be a better mouse trap and just figure it out. And I, I think a lot of lab people are the same way, unless like Jonathan, you come into it 
doing it or only knowing the way your folks did it or grandma and, and, and mom and then you're in the new generation so you have to pick up on computers. I have lab people that don't even have computers or don't have a fax machine to be able to fax over an order. And I'm going, wow, you know. And at some point in time, I'm going to have to make all my customers send an order and a hard copy. Because, well, that's not what I wanted. Well, that's what you told me you wanted. No, it's not, you know. So. So is most everyone using QuickBooks then? Or what are you using? I'm WinVoice. WinVoice? It's an online billing system. QuickBooks, okay. We use uh, LabNet. LabNet. And uh, we're, we're real happy with LabNet, but in the direction that we're, the industry's going with receiving digital scans and such, uh, the product that Michael Wright has, this EZRX, is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's really a wonderful software. Um, I think the billing side of it gets tied into QuickBooks, uh, but it's 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 really nice, it, especially as we start to receive more and more intraoral scans from the offices. It is it just makes perfect sense. We're trying. Michael's been very patient with this because we're trying to just move our our digital anything coming in digital to EZRX and still sticking with the the. Uh, lab net for the everything else uh, but it's it's clumsy to do things half this way and half that way and so uh, I, I know the product really well I've seen it demonstrated a lot of times if I was just starting out or I was looking to to uh, a software for my laboratory if I wasn't happy 100% with what I was using I, I've looked at a lot of softwares um, I would go to EZRX hands down. I mean, it would just, it, it, it's a no brainer. It's more difficult for uh, a lab that's been doing something for a lot of years, a certain way to, to switch. But uh, if you get a chance, take a look at it. What I like about EZRX is that it is cloud based, and you hear that term all the time. And the advantage of being cloud based is, is um, it's, you, you, you don't have to worry about backing up your system because it's cloud-based and there's redundant backups. It's um, it's just a very safe way to uh, to to operate. So uh, if you get a chance, hopefully Michael will get in here yeah, somewhere. Yeah, during the break, I'll try to get him on. We can talk about uh, it. Because if you can get him to demonstrate this product, if you haven't seen it, it's it's pretty special. Uh, when I saw the product the first time, Michael was he was he was showing what he developed for his laboratory. And we had a bunch of people we had met together for kind of a think tank and Michael showed us his product. And we all came away thinking that this is something that he could sell to other labs, not just use for his laboratory. And I, and I think that the influence of that group kind of nudged them into the direction. I'm glad to, they did that because I was following him and uh, I was like, please, <laughs> I was following him online, but he was his, Demos and I was like, please make this for other labs. Cause, and it, it, just a quick breakdown: the the doctor gets a script on his screen and he fills it out and he can draw it and everything. And so everything he draws out, it automatically gets billed right then. So what they draw gets billed. There's no somebody re-entering it in in the lab again. It's already entered in. And then yeah, and they just you just drag a drop it. You grab an Adam's clasp and you drop it to where you want it. And if it if you dropped it on the wrong tooth, you can move it. And you grab a bow and you drop it. And if you want the bow to extend distal to the floors, you do that. And it's it's just all dragging and dropping. It the potential for it to eliminate you know the errors that we see from handwritten scripts is is wonderful there. But the fact that uh, Cade mentioned that it's it's billing it as they're dropping these parts and it's billing it for you. So when you receive the script, you just check it in. Uh, and you check it for accuracy and you ch check it in, but it, basically the doctor's pre-invoiced his own case for you. And, and he still follows what the case I'm sorry? You still send out what the case? Well, it, the idea with this is yeah, this would be, uh, you would use this with a digitally uploaded interoil scan. 
So it'd be the digital <laughs> process, but they can use it in in you know our traditional way. They can still use the system. It works very well. Uh, and what's kind of nice is you have that work ticket printed waiting for the model to arrive. So when the model does arrive, it's very easy to just put the two together. You, you don't have to do the case entry now because it's the doctor's done it for you. So or the office they manager. The terminology. Every time you get right. to the doctor, you got to learn all the terminology. Yeah. yeah. They're shorthand. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it, where where they went to school too, and, yeah. you know, and, and that's. You know, how many cringe when it's NYU? Oh, what's that? How many cringe when it's NYU? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if we get doctors from up there. So. Yeah. yeah, that uh, that's interesting. Y'all you know, mentioned that uh, about the sending the model uh, with the case and and the digital. I think that's the the future. Possibly, and we're, it's here now, so you can play with it. And and I like it. He also included piecework, so if you pay your technicians piecework, they enter in the case, and it's already got labial bow, two atoms clasp, acrylic, and it they can record the the, uh, the technician with the case and what they did, and you know, how to print it, fill out things. And they have, and they just got a lot of different levels. You can you can. You can purchase the dummy down one, you know, or you can, you know. Oh, sorry. The, the thing I was trying to remember was no more printers. No more send, getting your scripts printed up out of printers and paying for it. They, If they want to print it using the system, they just use their own paper in their own office. And they can send that with the case, too. So I, I thought that, you know, I don't know how much I'll spend on printers a month. Or Anybody want to throw a number out there? And it, it's triplicate or double mounts. Who uses triplicate? Carbon copy. Carbon copy, sorry. Triplicate. It's three of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I used, someone used two. Yeah, we used two. But we have gone, uh, you know, you have to keep the scripts for, what is it, seven years or mm -hmm. something like that. We, um, the NADL will allow you to, they accept a scan as being the same as keeping the original script now. And they have for for several years, and since they uh, initiated that, we we don't keep scripts anymore. We scan everything, and with LabNet, we attach that that prescription to that invoice all digitally. You know, and uh, it's nice because if we do get a call from a doctor, uh, we can we can we can pull obviously pull the invoice up, but we can also click on it. It just says attachments. We click on a button, and it brings that prescription up front and back. So it's you know no more running to the file cabinet, you know trying to you know I I, I know I wrote I know I wrote a blue retainer. You sent me a pink retainer, and we can look it up real quick. And how does the doctor sign that? They the digital prescriptions. So we we have ours online and everything else. There's there's a um, they. There's a process that that is they they create a signature. They choose what they want it to look like, the type of font and everything else. But then you have a contract between the office and the laboratory that like yes yes. I think in the state of Texas, the doctor said you can pick up the case. You have to have a, a signature. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's. Uh, I know Michael Wright is is researching all the different laws and stuff, and and uh, he's very caught up on HIPAA compliance because yes, you can't even email a picture of a according to HIPAA if I'm right, or at least not with the name of the patient in there. But then, you know, how's the doctor gonna know who that patient is unless it's a really unique case? But you can send pictures through this secure server he set up. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> Zen, Zendura? Yeah, that's, that's it. it. We got Michael Wright's listening. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Wright. Okay.
you know, it's getting close to break. Let's go ahead and take a break for about 15 minutes and meet back, and I'll try to get Michael right. Great. Yeah, it's in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's great. And it was really a great little program. Oh, yeah. And all that stuff's going to go. Because they're seeing the respond leader and then all of a sudden the program said, you know, you're on day. Uh, everybody here is getting some work. Oh, you were yeah. supposed to see. Oh, oh really? Right. And I was only yeah, on that for the last years. But I walked in the other room. Yeah. And I just got the authorization. I paid them. I let you have a book in the middle of the book. I put it on one of the computers and I just let them know it's there. I'm going to try to do the same. Yeah, this is awesome. I think he's going to do a demonstration of it. It's, it's really nice. And it's, uh, it gives your technicians a, a, a very uh, nicely drawn out prescription. You know, where they don't have to read. They just can look at the picture and know what, what has to be done. And like I said, it's... it's uh, just grab it, have his plasma, and just put it wherever you want it, a finger screen, but whatever. He's got pretty much everything covered. Yeah, I couldn't tell. No one did. There's something you do in your laboratory that isn't covered there. Maybe you have some unique product or appliance. They'll, they'll make a template for it. Minnesota? So, yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, whatever it is. Not that. We're in that in Coral Springs, uh, yeah. Yeah. which everybody gets confused with Coral Gables. Coral, Coral Gables is a, uh, a very high end area of Miami, not too far from the University of Miami. Coral Springs is like West Fort Lauderdale. Where if, if I drive east I'm, uh, to the ocean, I'm just a little bit uh, north of Fort Lauderdale. But uh, Coral Springs sits. Yeah, it's the westernmost edge of the east coast there. Um, if we go any further west, we're in Yamaha. Yeah, so we just, it's a, a, a great place to raise a family, good schools and all that. Um, and, but you know, our kids are grown now and everything else. We're, we're uh, transitioning. We, we bought a place east now, which is it's, um, it's nice to be closer to the ocean and uh, the, the east side of town. You, know, you can walk to places and stuff like that. You can't do that out west. You know, it's like suburbia out west. So it's it's, it's we bought a townhouse and we're really looking forward to selling the other house and moving forward. To it. And we'll be in a town then called Pompano Beach. I got a lot of families that move down to Fort Myers. Okay, yeah, the other coast. Flew down there to see my mother several years back, and just we went from the airport over to her place. You know, in my mind, I said, "This damn thing is so secure. It's well worth it." I mean, they live, here. but you know, it's when we go out at seven, eight o'clock, they go out at four o'clock. Yeah, and you know, by six o'clock they're in bed. Yeah, it's very sleepy over there. Uh, very quiet. I had a um, uh, a cousin whose parents retired there. And uh, the dad was just too active, and, and, it, and so he ended up. They ended up moving over to to the East Coast, which is a little more active. Yeah. Beaches and stuff are prettier over there. Sunsets are gorgeous. Uh, property values are reasonable again. That got insane over there for with you know 2006, 2000. You know when everything just kept going up. Uh, but I, I like I like the East Coast better. It's just more active. You know more to do. Activity. I think in the water sport wise, like fishing and stuff, is better on, on the East Coast as well. I think on the West Coast, you've got to go out far to get to the reefs and stuff where we, we can go out a half a mile more over the reefs. 
My wife works for the power company, and she's on um, hurricane. Uh, what do you call it? 